Welcome back everyone, Michael here with Offshore Citizen. Just came back from dinner and figured I would give you a video on something that has happened just in the last couple days, which is, I mentioned on a video, maybe yesterday, the day before, something like that, about how the UST peg had broken. This is uh, a supposedly stable coin on uh, the Terra network kind of famously related to it, and Terra basically went to zero. So I'm gonna explain a little bit about what happened, maybe some things that you can learn. This doesn't just really apply to uh, UST and to Terra and to crypto in general, it applies to other things as well. So let's dive in and discuss what happened and how you can protect yourself in the future. Before we do, if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button, hit the all notification bell. If you enjoy our videos, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. If you would like help with paying as low as, as close to zero as legally as possible on your global taxes, relocating abroad, getting residencies and citizenships, figuring out where to relocate, forming companies, opening bank accounts, all that kind of stuff, you can reach out to us on our team, www.offshorecitizen.net, or you can book a call with me at www.calendly.com forward slash Michael dash Rosmer. There's a link in the description below. Okay. So let's quickly go through what happens here. So just really quickly, uh, there is a chain on uh, a crypto chain uh, called the Terra chain. It has the token Luna is the base token there for it. And there is a stable coin on there called UST. Now UST was supposed to be a quote unquote algorithmic stable coin. I don't know whether I would call it really an algorithmic stable coin. That's probably not the best way of referring to it, and we'll get into that in a second, but this was the, uh, this was the deal. You had this, uh, so the whole point is, it's supposed to match the US dollar at all times, tradable one for one. And so there's all sorts of projects on the Terra ecosystem, some of them good, uh, other ones great, uh, you know, good teams, cool stuff going on, interesting community, but this had been one of the high-flying tokens, it had in up to about $20 billion market cap, I think it peaked maybe at $23 billion, I want to say. And uh, UST had risen to being one of the top stable coins, was, I think around $20 billion market cap. And over the last little while, the peg was lost, meaning that it was no longer able to hold itself at one-to-one -one and started to go into a death spiral and collapse. And in the meantime, uh, Luna, the token for UST, went to pretty much zero I uh, got delisted, the network got shut down, all kinds of stuff. So what happened? How could this catastrophe have taken place? So just really quickly, uh, there's different ways of trying to achieve a stable coin. Okay, a stable coin is just this idea of maintaining a peg, and usually it is somehow based on redemption value, meaning that the idea is uh, someone should always be able to redeem that for an equivalent amount, right? In this case, a dollar. So we have this, for example, USDC, it's the most famous one from Circle, it's highly regulated. And basically the idea is that they have $1 of reserves for every token that is minted. And if you want, you could in theory cash that out and get the dollar in turn in the token and they would destroy the token. USDT is supposed to be similar, although backed by commercial paper and it's really opaque and it's hard to say how much of it is backed and how much of it isn't, a whole other conversation, right? Then you have something like DAI, which I've kind of famously said is probably my preferred stable coin at this point in time, which is backed by a mix of USDC and various different other crypto assets and things like this. And normally what they would do is you would deposit in some token, for example, Ethereum, and they would say, okay, if you deposit in one Ethereum, or like one, let's say a dollar thirty worth of Ethereum, you'll be able to create one dollar worth of DAI and you can swap in the die for the Ethereum, but what it has is a liquidation engine on it so that as it goes closer and closer down, it's gonna sell off long before it gets to that. And so the over collateralization helps this to happen, okay? So that's a different different approach and DAI has been very successful as well. There's PAX, uh, there's BUSD, there's, there's many, right? There's many, many stable coins. The holy grail supposedly has been to have an algorithmic stable coin. And the reason why this is important for a lot of people is if you look at something like USDC, they can freeze your uh, transactions. They can stop your tokens. And this means it's open to regulatory, institutional, 
etc. risk, which is very anti-crypto, anti-Web3. So the idea is, well, if you could have an algorithmic state, and why do they more or less have to do that? Well, because they're holding bank reserves somewhere and you know the government can come and freeze their stuff. So there's sort of this, we have our hands around your neck, so you're gonna do what I say sort of thing. Now, up to this point in time, that really hasn't been used that much. And so USDC has been a more effective set of payment rails than say the SWIFT network. It's cheaper, faster, easier to send money via USDC if it's already on USDC than it would be to say, go to your bank account and do a wire transfer, okay? Okay, fair enough. All of that should hopefully kind of make sense. Uh, the idea behind a, an algorithmic stable coin is that you could have purely synthetics behind it. There's nothing actual real and somehow the algorithm would be able to balance itself out and maintain this peg. Why you'd want to make it pegged to the US dollar, you know, you can kind of get into comments about that. And of course there's stable coins related to other uh, currencies as well, like euros, etc. So it's, it's interesting, right? The principle with uh, Terra and UST was that in order to mint, so basically to create a dollar of UST, you would take a dollar worth of Luna and you would what we call burn it, basically destroying it, uh, and it would pop out at the other side one UST. And the rule was you could always exchange one UST back for one dollar of Luna, okay? Okay, fair enough. Now, part of the problem came in with something called Anchor Protocol, because Anchor Protocol was super compelling. Anchor Protocol gave a flat 19.5% yield, basically an interest, for depositing UST into the protocol, all right? And this was very attractive. So they accumulated something like 17 or 18 billion dollars worth of UST on deposit, generating yield at the peak. And so basically a lot of people were minting a lot of UST, which was really good for the Luna ecosystem because the, it caused the market cap of Luna to spike. UST looks good. All these metrics look good. People are excited. Do Kwan, the founder of Terraform Labs, the company behind it, you know, he's you know, looking like a hero, all this kind of thing. But it was fundamentally not sustainable. And the reason it's not sustainable is because, well, it works so long as the market cap of UST is dramatically less than the market cap of Luna because there's enough Luna that you just keep uh, converting it over and you're fine. Where it becomes a problem is if the market cap of Luna drops below that of UST and now the demand of funds to get out may be greater than the amount that they're able to redeem, right? So how, uh, how did this take place? So what happened fundamentally was uh, there was a variety of different things. Do Kwan, the founder, was honestly very arrogant and stupid. Uh, he was literally warned uh, a few months in advance about this, that some billionaire could come and basically do a George Soros-like attack on UST and take it out. And he was tweeting, like, this is the most ridiculous thing I've read. Uh, any billionaires in my feed, go ahead and try it and see what happens. Well, you know, we got to see what happens. Basically, he wiped out the entire chain of everything. So, you know probably in excess of $40 billion of market cap lost. Pretty, pretty big losses for a lot of people. Um, the way this happened was the price is insured by arbiters, okay? In other words, because of the fact that if, if the price is maintained through uh, trading pairs, okay? So you'd have, in this particular example, one USDC and one uh, UST, well, there's actually pools of them, and they should be equal because if you pull one out, then the pool is imbalanced. And so basically to the extent that uh, if you were to have somebody say selling a whole bunch of UST, that would mean they'd be depositing it into the pool and withdrawing USDC, right? So the pool becomes imbalanced and the pricing determined by the pool is based on this balance back and forth, okay? And essentially if it gets imbalanced, you can just imagine that because somebody can then go and buy UST for lower, they can then run over to what's called Terra Station, which is the piece of software that allows them to convert it into Luna, and they can sell that and they can get a dollar. And so it basically, say they could buy it for 98 cents, they run over there, they get a dollar, and they can just keep doing that over and over again, making a bunch of money. So hence, the incentive is to keep it in sync. And the same goes on the other side, right? Okay, hopefully that is pretty clear. So somebody ended up in one of these pools, uh, something called pool three, uh, there was about 350 million in UST, uh, and you know, 
approximately an equivalent amount of USDC, and they pulled all of this UST out, okay? Which essentially meant that, uh, I have that? yeah, so, so basically they imbalanced the pool. I think I may have kind of articulated it wrong before, but anyway, bottom line is they imbalanced the pool, causing that to indicate that the peg was off. Now, in theory, this is not that bad a thing if it's just briefly, right? So the peg can shift slightly, but it started to slip. And uh, previously, about a month before, uh, Doc Kwan, uh, the founder there, had set up something called LFG, which was uh, basically a reserve fund in order to protect uh, the peg. Okay, in the event that the peg would break, they could deploy this capital to counter it off and reverse it. And they put $1.7 billion into Bitcoin. Okay, all right, great, put some money into Bitcoin. Well, so the peg started to break, they took some of their money, they started to deploy to protect it. Now, here's the problem. As soon as the peg starts to break, people begin to lose confidence. And if people start to lose confidence, what do they do? They start to sell UST, which just exasperates the process, right? You're saying, hey, listen, let me pull up my UST and uh, go and get USDC uh, instead, right? Or flip to whatever else, DAI or some, some other stable coin, right? So off they go, they start selling. And so the more that the, you get this cascading sell, the more money you need to put on the other side to counter it. And maybe you have enough money to counter it. Uh, it just depends. In this particular case, uh, based on the confidence, they did not. And so, okay, this started to happen. The money that they had to spend reverses. Now, here's, here's where the first problem comes in. Because they held the reserves in Bitcoin, in order to deploy that Bitcoin in order to pay off uh, this, these declining reserves, they had to go and they had to convert the Bitcoin, which meant they had to sell the Bitcoin. Now, when you sell $1.7 billion of something, the price is going to go down. So, this reduces the, the amount of Bitcoin, which means that they've technically lost some of their 1.7 billion. So maybe they end up with 1.5 billion they can deploy. So they throw 750 million here and 750 million here, whatever, right? Well, that's not a great start. Uh, it certainly weakens your ability to protect. So in the theory, they probably should have had this all in some sort of cash type reserves, right? Probably USDC or something like that, something that would match the, the pools or whatever other source. The other thing that had happened at the same time was that over the last while the market's been beaten down and the market cap of Luna has decreased. And you'll notice that there's this interesting thing happening here where as the market cap of Luna goes down because people are going for safer assets, they switch into stable coins, which may include UST, and they want to get yield, so they go and they buy up, put it into Anchor Protocol to go and earn 20% yield, which is also UST, and this balance imbalance starts to grow. Bad sign, right? Okay, at first, uh, I, we did, uh, through my one company, uh, Twitter spaces where we kind of articulated what was going on and we're watching it and we brought on various different experts from Terra and various different uh, fund managers and a bunch of other people. We kind of talked it through for several hours uh, on three days in a row. Anyway, so the, uh, the price started to go down. The more it went down, the less the confidence you had. Now, here's the thing. So there is a limit on how much you can swap each day through this, what's called uh, the Terra Station, where you're able to swap from UST to Luna. And it's act, supposed to act like a circuit breaker so that if people get overly excited and you get craziness, et cetera, people will just go, go flooding to the doors and crash the price too quickly, right? So it's basically there's a base of 50 million and by some mechanisms it can be 200 million a day, right? Which is for an asset with $20 billion market cap is not very much, right? You're talking about 100 days to be able to swap that all over. Anyway, so uh, you hit that limit pretty quick, right? And uh, so within the network itself, it was still showing, okay, you know, we'll, we're willing to pay out, but nobody can actually use that to redeem. And so in the meantime, there's this fluctuation in price as people are trying to trans convert out into other assets and, you know, buyers are willing to pay them only a discount for it and things like this. So the peg went down, the peg went back up, uh, you know, kind of varied around a little bit. I guess it's not the peg, but the, the price uh, went up and down around there. And uh, so then the next day, they said, okay, well, we're, we have this plan to save it. We're gonna raise another $1.5 billion. They announced they were working with, I think it was three major firms, and the deal was gonna be, hey, they'll sell them Luna at a rate of 50% discount, 
uh, to be locked up for a year and then they can get it out and this is going to save it. Uh, but we're waiting for the last player. We've got the couple, first couple players who have agreed. The last player we'll see shortly. Okay, fair enough. Seems straightforward, right? Um, not, not so much. Over the next little while, the price of Luna got obliterated. And the reason why the price of Luna gets obliterated is because, again, you take UST, you convert it into Luna, as you can, when it, then you sell the Luna in order to actually get the real money, right? Well, what did you do? You just increased the supply of Luna, inflation, and you sold that selling pressure, right? So this combination is really bad. So the price of Luna went down like 70%, something crazy. And uh, so this kind of gradually gets worse and worse. So I actually ended up shorting at a certain point. I kind of took a look at it and said, it was just mathematically certain that it was going to zero. And the reason it was mathematically certain is pretty simple, so I'll kind of explain it to you. Uh, the quantity of the, the total market cap of Luna was at the time that I shorted about 3 billion. The market cap of UST was about 10 billion. So you can already see there's selling pressure, potentially of 10 billion on 3 billion of market cap. This is a problem. But on top of that, at the time UST was at about 62 cents. Uh, which meant that the real market, the, the real selling pressure comes from the total, mar total supply, one each, which would approximately be 17, 18 billion. So you've got 17 or 18 billion selling pressure that's just going to keep hammering on uh, this, uh, this 3 billion market cap. It is mathematically impossible for that to survive, right? On top of this, you can realize that when the asset is sliding so quickly, right, like that, and all this selling pressure is driving it down, there's not a chance that anyone will throw in money to bail it out. This will not happen. I talked to some people in uh, building on the Terra ecosystem and people running validator nodes and venture capitalists and different things on the first night. People were saying, oh, you know, like, look at how many VCs are behind this. You know, you think they're really gonna let it fail? Yes, yes, they will. VCs have been in many, many businesses that have failed, Webvan, for example, and uh, they are not going to throw their investors money, good money after bad. Nobody is going to do something heroic here. They're going to do something that is profitable for their investors or they will not do it at all. And there's no way you're going to bloody yourself in this situation. On top of that, $1.5 billion is insufficient to close that gap. You can maybe postpone it a little bit, but with the shattered confidence, the billions of dollars trying to get out, there's no way you can do this. And there's no way you're going to be able to raise the money on the other side. So this is a complete non-starter. And so it's, it's just very inevitable. Now, as soon as you realize it's inevitable, you realize the next problem that's going to happen, which is other people will see that it's inevitable and they're going to short it. And it's, all the short sellers are going to drive the price of Luna down faster, which is going to mean that the amount of Luna you need to print in order to redeem one UST is growing. And the more that you print, the more it's growing and it just is going to cascade. So you can go and you can look at a chart of the supply and the supply is going it's very much similar to what happens uh, in a real hyperinflation case, which I think I've mentioned in some previous videos. When you have real hyperinflation, this is one of the reasons why you will not likely see hyperinflation in the US and places like that anytime soon, you have some foreign denominated debt, meaning that you can't use your own currency to pay it off. In this case, you needed to use uh, Luna to pay off something that was stable, right? This is a problem, okay? So anytime you have uh, I, I can print one thing to try and pay off something that's fixed, then in order to do that, I'm eventually going to hyperinflate it, right? Because I'm going to have to print more and more, and the more that I print, the more that I have to print, and I get into this cascading run. So this is a good reason to have only debts denominated in the currency that you, know, you have kind of control over, right? So uh, yeah, so, so this proceeded to collapse over a period of some number of hours. Uh, like I said, billions of dollars of people's money were lost, etc. Now, it, it's worth understanding, and this is kind of an interesting thing, a lot of people are very against something like the Fed, right? There's a lot of narrative out there, like the Fed is bad, central banks are bad, etc. Now, the truth is, we have a history of periods of time where there was no central banks, and it wasn't really that great, right? Now, you can argue there's lots of problems with central banks, there are lots of problems with central banks, but there's, they're also there for a reason which is we used to historically have bank runs uh, quite a bit. I mean, there's a bunch of different reasons, but bank runs are one of them. And, and so to stop bank, and so we basically essentially saw a bank run. And if you can't 
stop that bank run pretty quickly, what happens is the loss of confidence just explodes, right? And it just rolls down and causes a lot of issues. So uh, as I'm doing this this morning, I think it was, uh, USDT actually broke peg pretty dramatically. It went down something like 13 cents at the peak, at least according to Binance, relative to uh, USDT, which is, or sorry, USDC, uh, which is insane, like very, very crazy. Uh, but basically they redeemed $2 billion worth of people's uh, redemption requests and it balanced out and it was fine. But the concern there was, you know, what really is happening? People were saying, oh, UST just crashed and USDT is next. So people start to get paranoid and they start to run and they start to they accelerate the selling faster than the redeeming is happening in uh, the short term, right? And so you get this. Now, it turns out that was a great arbitrage opportunity. Some people ended up going and making, you know, a ton of money off of it, which is great. But yeah, very, uh, very difficult to stop this if you don't have some mechanism to provide rapid liquidity. Now, uh, and I actually talked to the uh, chief technical lead from MakerDAO, which is uh, the DAI uh, stablecoin, about this, because one of the things they're interested in doing is going to uh, some physical collateral, non-crypto like crypto collateral, so maybe real estate or whatever else, which is important for scaling the network and scaling the asset and things like that. The thing that you run into potentially is that you can't redeem this quickly enough. So this is the classic problem of why you have bank reserves. So some people say, oh, you know, fractional reserve lending is bad. And I've talked about kind of the myth of how that lending works. But more importantly, why is, in theory, you could just lend out everything you bring in, right? This is, normally happens inside funds. If I go and I give you money into a mortgage investment corporation, for example, I give you my money, you take my money, you go and lend it out. I have no reserves left, right? Now, the thing there is I can't res re uh, uh, get my reserves back on demand, right? There's like some sort of a redemption period or some schedule when I can do it, uh, how much I can take out, maybe I'm waiting until various loans get paid off, etc. In the case of a bank, it's supposed to be demand deposits, right? Meaning you can just call on them at any time. Now, if you're in a situation where the asset, the, the bank may be fully covered with assets, right? They may have many more assets than are necessary for that particular investment uh, or for that particular amount of deposits, sorry. The problem is those may not be liquid, meaning you may not just be able to hand them all out. And so they're required by law to have a certain amount that are liquid, but then they might have, you know, some in long-term mortgages or something. Now they can sell those mortgages and those mortgages might have fair value, but if you have to sell them quickly, you're going to have to sell them at a discount. And so you can quickly become insolvent, not which means that you basically have more uh, debts than uh, assets or uh, liabilities than assets, simply because you're selling these things down at a discounted rate, which is kind of a similar thing to what was happening with Luna, right? If the inflows from Luna just to, through normal network operations had been driving the price up at the same rate that the money was going out, you're fine. But when you end up in a situation where the outflows are exceeding the inflows, then all of a sudden you get this cascading downward effect. So anyway, what, what can we learn from this? Well, first of all, a few things. Uh, in general, it's always good to understand where money is coming from when you're doing an investment. To understand, okay, like if I, they're giving me this yield, how are they doing that? Because Anchor was a big issue here. Even though people actually didn't have problems with Anchor, Anchor attracted the money, which caused the issue overall. Second of all, I was able to make a really good trade here uh, just because of the fact that I understood the mechanism between USD, uh, or UST and Luna, and a bunch of people didn't. I saw people videos from people today uh, that were had posted during that time, and they're saying, oh, you know, like, I'm gonna buy this and it's gonna come back and all this. No, no, like, you don't understand the mechanism. If you understand the mechanism, you know this is not the case. Uh, at the time, I told a bunch of friends, I was like, listen, like, the most logical thing to do right now is to short. It is like the most certain trade you're gonna have. And I was very confident to hold that all the way down because I knew that it has to go there, right? Like it's just the natural pressure is going to take it there, which is what happened. So anyway, a bunch of these things I think are, uh, it's worth it to understand the mechanisms behind what you're getting into. There's a whole kind of concept of responsibility, right? The idea behind crypto is you're responsible for yourself. And it's very interesting that when people are supposed to be responsible for themselves and then they get burned, they say, oh, we should have regulations or something. Well, you know, this is a personal responsibility thing, which is probably a better way to live. In addition to that, uh, you're in a case where 
People are told, do your own research, but most people really don't do their own research, right? So doing your own research, very important. Uh, in addition to this, it's worth it to understand how bank run mechanics can work and where they can show up. Uh, that's very important. And then finally, the concept of reflexivity, which is you know, how this would drive the price of Luna down. And because it drives the price of Luna down, you end up with this cascading effect. So I hope that helps very, you know, kind of high level explanation without getting into the weeds of what people believe who did something or whether it was targeted, et cetera. I will say some people said, hey, listen, you know, this was a targeted attack. Decent chance that it was, but that's not really an excuse for having bad mechanics. You're in a situation where the whole point of crypto economics is supposed to be adversarial game theory. And so if you can't survive an adversarial game theory simulation, then your system isn't well designed. So you should probably redesign it. We will see. It was really tough for a lot of people. I mean, market in general went down. Lots of good projects. I mean, essentially were wiped out to nothing. Uh, very, very, very bad situation for a lot of people. So really, really unfortunate that that happened. Uh, per perhaps the biggest or second biggest uh, thing in crypto history negatively. Uh, but anyway, hopefully it helps. Let me know if you have questions, put them in the comments below, and I will look forward to seeing you on the next video.